All right. I mean, you guys saw the opening day series between the Mets and the Brewers. It was awful. It was terrible. I'm not even going to do the fun intro that we normally do because uh, we're not with the Mets anymore, so we don't have to pretend to be happy. We don't have to pretend to take the good things out of this. There was almost nothing good from this series. There was a couple good things, but that's not what you guys want to hear about right now. You saw the games just like we did, and they were terrible. So we're going to talk about the series, as we always do. We appreciate you guys stopping in every after every series. We'll be dropping an episode, as always. So make sure you're following us on our social media and on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, whatever it is, Metz Up everywhere, Metz Up YouTube channel as well. But yeah, James, out in Italy, a little bit of an early morning recording for you, 7 a.m. over there, or maybe even 8 a.m. now, 2 a.m. over here. How are we feeling after you've had some sleep now? You've literally had time to sleep on this opening day performance by the Mets. Well, how's it feel? Still completely miserable. Even crazy talking to my family yesterday. I'm in Italy. It's going to be a couple of messed up international episodes. But even with an international flight on Saturday evening, I think I missed maybe two and a half innings of Mets baseball this whole weekend. So that's just me being a masochist, but also me wanting to help deliver some great content to you guys. But it sucked. It fucking sucked. Every, about every single inning of Mets baseball this week was awful. And... It was a vibe thing. It was a feeling thing. It was an attitude thing. It was an energy thing. It felt like this team just stayed in the same path that their feet have been stuck in for almost a year now, almost 200 games now, dating back to basically it feels like September 2022. And it's just, it was a three game series and including flying across, across the world and even sleeping on this game. It felt so long and just that I wanted it to end. And I didn't even feel like there was a remote chance for a game to be won the series after the way the basically the first one went. Yeah, like Reese Hoskins, if we if this series went a little bit better, that would probably be one of the main things we're talking about. We will get to it. I have my thoughts and you know on what was going on with Reese Hoskins there, but truthfully, I, I like this team. I, I tweeted out earlier in the day, like during the game, that I, I'm ready to overreact after three games. That's a good tweet, good bait. And now that I've had 12 hours to think about it, I think my overreaction feels a little bit more warranted, a little more sculpted a little more honest about what i'm going to be saying here and you kind of mentioned it this is not a three game overreaction this is a 200 game overreaction because we saw this happen seemingly after the mets beat the dodgers in september in 2022 they did not play well after that they got knocked out early in the playoffs and then for the 2023 season they kind of just did the same thing and yes in a vacuum the 2024 season has only existed for three games carlos mendoza is the manager it's different it's a different team theoretically but a lot of those same pieces are here. It it relatively is the same team with a few new guys here and there. And J.D. Martinez might be coming, whatever. That's not even my concern. My concern is that it feels like right now there's a bit of, there's, there's something missing, an edge, uh, fight, fire. And I really thought that that Reese Hoskins play, that slide, was maybe going to bring a little bit of fire, bring a little bit of energy to this team. But they were just lifeless this weekend. And I'm not going to call it effort. I think everybody's trying, but it has to be better. It has to be better. This isn't a three games into the season problem. This is now multiple seasons. This is spanning across hundreds of games where the Mets have been stuck in this malaise of just mediocre baseball with good baseball players. Guys step up at times. Guys don't at times. Like I, I don't know. When is it going to turn around? Because this team shouldn't be as bad as they performed this weekend. They shouldn't be. That's not even Mets bias. This team is not that bad. It's just being stuck in the mud. And I think something did change towards the end of the 2022 season. I, I hate keeping keep going back to this, but it just feels like there's a feeling that began then that still hasn't left this team. And the league changed where suddenly the Mets went from being like what they've been their entire franchise history as these very lovable underdogs and people root for them to now suddenly being hated. And every time someone comes to the park, you get their best shot. And I think a lot of that comes from having the richest owner in the sport. I think a lot of that, a lot of that comes from having just this this aura around them where it's kind of fun to watch them lose, which we see from other players. We heard Trevor May talk about. We see it from fans on the internet. Anytime anything happens to the Mets that's a little bit off, it goes mega viral. The Mets honored a veteran over the weekend who, who had a funny name, Seymour Wiener. And there were multiple tweets that had millions of impressions, including our own. Shout out you guys for our Twitter. We got 5 million impressions in a week of Mets baseball, which is a pretty great place for us to start. But... It's just anytime something happens to the Mets, it's magnified at national scale in a way that it wasn't before. Even this, but despite the fact we played in the biggest market, we played in New York. There's, and you could feel it with the Brewers. And the Brewers also had a lot extra. I feel like coming into the series, and the Reese Hoskins thing added to it. Well, Reese is a big rival. He's hated the Mets forever. We've had our dust ups with him. And we're going to talk about him in a little bit. But 
we fully stole their president baseball operation, something we alluded to earlier in the offseason. It felt like this team did have a bit of tenacity and edge coming into the series that was expounded on by the Reese Hoskins situation, whereas the Mets should have had that edge like, we, we daddied you taking your general manager. Like, we have better players than you anyway. Like, let's sun you right now. And it very clearly, the exact opposite happened. And opening day was a weird vibe to start it. The whole Saturday Reese Hoskins situation was a strange way to end it, a strange way to continue it. And then Sunday's game of just getting purely beat from beginning to end. Just and like they didn't have a lead, I don't believe, after the Reese Hoskins situation. It's just they got they got murdered by a team that if you do want to be in the playoff position in the National League, you have to be simply better than and they very clearly were not. Yeah. I mean the the it's really hard when you see the Yankees as well. And I think this is something that I, I tweet about earlier too. And Mets are not the Yankees. Yankees are a way better baseball team, no doubt, right now. But Juan Soto has brought something to this Yankees team that they have been missing for, what, the last 10 years? A little bit of swagger, a little bit of edge, a little bit of confidence that they lacked. And it, I see what he's done for that Yankees team, what he's brought over there. And I'm like, when it, where are we getting this for the Mets? Because there seems to be a lack of a true leader right now on this Mets team. And that, I don't think that's necessarily even calling out like Lindor or Pete or Nimmo or whoever you want to call it. Some of those guys are lead by example. Some of those guys aren't going to be the person who's going to kick your ass or whatnot. But it feels like right now that it's a bunch of good players with a little bit of lack of leadership in terms of the player side. I don't think it's fair to Carlos Mendoza to judge on two games because he, of course, got suspended uh, for Johan Ramirez throwing at Reese Hoskins. But there's there's just something missing that this team is not clicking right now, and it's concerning. Three games into the season, I didn't think I was going to be saying this, but again, it is not a three-game problem. This is a year-and-a-half problem now, and I don't know when, if, how they're going to snap out of it because if this weekend is indicative of how this team is going to play this year, I will tell you right now, I will not be at City Field very often. It was an unenjoyable experience this weekend. The, the stadium was dead silent. The play was lackluster. There was nothing good to take out of the series outside of maybe Francisco Alvarez is a fucking dog. Brett Beatty hit a left-handed home run. Like, but even then, that's like that's what we're talking about is good players' performance. If I wanted to do that, we could have been doing the podcast still with the team and pretending like things are okay, but that's not the case. That's just not what this team's vibes are right now. These vibes are bad, and I don't know what the fuck's going to happen. It's swagger. It's edge. Like They're not playing like a team that every other team is coming to the ballpark saying, I want to kill you. They're not playing like that. They're still playing like they're this lovable upstart, which they were for a little while, and they were for like, what, 50 years before that. But now it's just different. Your team has a different vibe. They haven't like taken an identity of the bad guys yet. And it seems like they have no intention to either, which is like, maybe that's not the way these players feel as baseball players. Like, I don't think I can see Brandon Nimmo being a bad guy or Francisco Lindor being a bad guy. But when every other team comes to your ballpark intending to to crush you, not just beat you. Like teams seems to have a different feeling when they come to City Field. And that teams relish in the opportunity of coming to the Mets and beating them in front of the richest owner in sports, in front of some fans that they know are just incensed and insane when one thing goes wrong. And it's not like it's, it's hard, hard to identify. But that situation with me on opening day, I feel like encapsulates it a lot. Where you had an opportunity where there's someone you already hate in front of you. Jeff McNeil called the match with Brees Hoskins, the dirtiest player in the league, after the game, and you're on top of. And like I do want to. It's weird because like a two sided thing. It's like my brain, like my normal brain, then my brain of like my baseball Mets brain, where it's like, okay, yeah, violence isn't the best thing in the world. Like he he does that to you, you standing over him. It looked like for a brief second, Jeff McNeil really wanted to hit Reese Hoskins in the face. So I'm like, okay, yeah, don't condone violence. Like that's a good thing. But also I'm like, punch him in the fucking face. Like he just tried to break your leg. Punch him in the face. And then like Pete Lindor come over and Hoskins already in the dugout, where it's like some like Jeff McNeil's one of the smallest guy in the infield. Like maybe someone someone push Reese Hoskins or someone get on top of it. But then it's also like like Mets honored Bud Harrelson before the game. Bud Harrelson's probably greatest highlight ever as a Met was in 1973, I believe, NLCS. And I was talking to my dad about all this, all these fights just uh, over the last couple of weeks. As Mets team used to fight a lot, especially like 86, 73. There's an edge, and how like in the NLCS, Bud Harrelson just clocked Pete Rose in the NLCS, clocked Pete Rose in the face, and Bud Harrelson was probably five foot seven, 165 pounds, soaking wet. He got murdered in that fight by Pete Rose, who was bigger, stronger, faster. More and more, more tenacious. And like that spurned a Mets victory in the series that they had no business winning over the big red machine. Who wound up winning like three World Series the rest of the decade, whereas that Mets team did nothing. And then there was also a fight you told me about in 86. I think it was towards the end of the year where Ray Knight slid to third base and he popped up and he looked at Eric Davis and he just clocked him in the head. And I think that part of that is because I don't think Ray Knight, yep. coming from the South, had the most favorable 
feelings towards everybody in the world, but Eric Davis and Daryl Strawberry are also lifelong best friends. And Ray Knight didn't think, hmm, how's Straw going to feel if I punch his best friend in the face? He's just like, no, I'm going to punch this dude in the face because he's pissing me off. And I think they're, that kind of is the, a little bit encapsulates the Mets issue right now is that there's too much thinking and there's not enough doing. There's no reacting. There's no playing. There's no, there's this lack of, like we're saying, edge, energy. It's just, there isn't this like, mm, there isn't this craziness. Like there's, I'm thinking about everything before I do it. Like I think even the situation as now we transition talking about the series where the Mets waited four at bats to throw out Reese Hoskins, where again, it's a new age in baseball, not something you totally condone throwing at the guy. You'd hate to hit a guy in the hands and take two months out of the season. You don't want to hurt somebody, but Reese Hoskins up in the first inning with a base open and two men out with no runs in. And it was the first thing that was already kind of weird because Zach Short made half of an error, didn't get called an error. I don't know why he didn't get called an error by the home score. As you could have taken three runs off the board for Luis Severino in his debut and got that ERA down. But there's a base open. And a player hit the player hitting behind Reese Hoskins' name was Oliver Dunn. I, I pride myself on knowing almost every single thing about Major League Baseball. I probably know 99.5% of players on Major League active rosters. And Oliver Dunn's name came up with a lineup card. I literally looked at it and said, Who the fuck is that? And I think we texted about it. He's hitting behind Reese Hoskins, who you want to put on base anyway. Put one in his butt, put one in his back, and then get the guy in first base, get out the the AAA player hitting behind him, and get out of the first inning with no runs. Instead, you let Reese Hoskins get comfortable, a player you hate, a player you loathe, a player that has done this to the Mets before and who likely will do this to the Mets again. You let him get comfortable. You let him change a game and seemingly change a whole weekend for you. And that part sucks. And you get clowned on social media. Your manager winds up getting suspended. Your player who throws at him three innings later winds up getting suspended. And the whole thing feels so awkward and so forced. And it's just like, why Why are we thinking? Why aren't we doing? Yeah, I think that's the perfect way to say it. I, I The Mets right now, it feels like there's so much thinking going on like even their approaches at the plate taking taking strike one that's a great pitch swinging at strike two that's in the dirt taking strike three down the middle like there's way too much thinking these guys are not playing everything feels too calculated too much too much thinking too much this too much that too much like i'm all we're all for the numbers here we're all for the game plan we're all for the analytics but it almost seems like it's crippling these guys at this point because they're not able to just go out there and just play. I don't, I don't know. Is that a, is that the problem with the analytics? I don't think so. Is that the problem with the players? I don't think so either, but there's no feel right now with this team at all. The feel is that they're they're dead. The feeling, it, it felt like a funeral at these games at times. Like you would think that the Mets were playing in September. They had 60 wins. They were getting their ass handed to them every single night. Like the crowd was quiet. The stadium wasn't playing any fucking music, like fan engagement, whatever. I don't know. I guess I guess we're really not focused on that as much as we claim. There's so many things going on that just don't feel right right now. And it all comes back to too much thinking, not enough playing, not enough reacting. Baseball is a fun fucking game. It is a game at the end of the day. There's not a lot of smiles on these guys besides Francisco Lindor. There's not a lot of having fun. This is like super lame, super boring, but... My God, is it, it, are they ever going to wake up and actually just play some baseball? Because there's just like little things happening throughout these games that, that don't make sense. Like, here's one example. Harrison Bader hit a piss missile off the left field wall, I think in game two, got thrown out at second base. Christian Yelich made a great throw, whatever. Like, I don't think there was bad base running from the, from the get-go. He should have never been going. But you challenge the arm, he made a great play, tip your cap, whatever. Today in game three, there was a line drive hit off the wall by William Contreras, Brandon Nimmo in left field. Seemed like he wasn't even ready for William Contreras to go for two. Made a shit throw. I love Brandon, but made a bad throw. William Contreras somehow gets a hustle double. A hustle double for a catcher who's not the fastest by any means. And those are the little things that were happening this weekend where I'm like, they're just outperforming us. They want it more. They're more ready. You mentioned it earlier. We stole their GM. They wanted to kick our ass, and it doesn't feel like the Mets want to beat the other teams right now. It feels like they're like, oh, we're friends with everybody except Reese Hoskins, but also at the same time, we didn't really even do anything to Reese Hoskins. So, like, maybe he is our friend. I don't know. It was just a bullshit feeling this weekend, and I fucking hate it, and I hope we can get rid of it. I'm sick and tired of it. 200 games worth of it. I thought it was a Buck Showalter problem. It's now fall, fallen into this season as well. I don't know what the fuck to do. Like, I, it is confusing because I'm not a negative Mets fan, but God, I feel so fucking negative right now about this team. That William Contreras double too. He was like so unathletic sliding into second base. And I'm not saying he's unathletic. He's an amazing player. He's like one, probably one of the best hitting catchers in the league right now. Very underrated. 
he slid so poorly that he jammed his cup into his own crotch and he had to like shake it out. The trainer came out to walk it off and he literally pointed to his midsection and was just like, yeah, just I pushed this into me. It kind of hurt a little bit. So that was a problem. But even just the way about like the fact that the Mets put a joke on the board about William Contreras' old walk-up song with the Braves being Narcos from like 2022. It's like, are we all stuck in this brain right now where it's like, why like move on, like get over this stuff. Like you're making a joke about a guy who's, who's been to the playoffs since, who had what, almost 30 home runs last year from the catcher position for a walk-up song that we haven't even heard yet. And again, even as dystopians, it kept getting. The Mets let Diaz come onto the field for the first time in a game where they're losing. And these trumpets come out, something that's been like championed on social media to like a, a bit of a nauseating degree at this point. And it's just like, oh, now we're listening to this and we're losing. Now the last two times Edwin Diaz has pitched, has been in front of a dead crowd in a losing ball club. And it's like, it sucks. It, the whole thing just fucking sucks. And you can't really watch this team and not be like, hmm, something feels wrong right now. And I, like, I don't want you to blame it on like numbers and analytics. You're just, you're just throwing chum to a bunch of sharks out there. And it's like, and now we've had different coaches and different front office people trying to administer probably similar data to this, to similar players. And there's still a lack of admin, administration of it. And it's just, again, I don't know, like this, it feels like there's just something rotten in this team. And like the, you mentioned in the beginning, like it, they're like not saying these guys don't have leadership qualities, but it doesn't seem like there's a player in the locker room who's like, I'm going to hold you accountable. I'm going to shake your chain. Like I'm going to, I'm going to yank you and say, this is what we're doing. This is how we're doing it. Like I'm not going to deal with this anymore. Like I don't think anybody threw a chair after the series, I'm not saying someone should throw chairs after the first series of the weekend, but even a team like the angels who are as big of a disaster as any ball club we've seen in the last half of a decade. Ron Washington holds a big old, big old team meeting after getting murdered two straight games to open the season, just because this isn't okay. Like this isn't, this isn't something we should expect. And it is stupider. Now you look at these Mets games, and every single game wound up being close late. Every single game was a save opportunity for the Brewers. And then you look at a team like the Brewers that stole five or six bases. They played great in defense. They put the ball in play ad nauseum. And it's just like things could have happened if the series have gone a different way, which is a total fucking replay of how we talked about this team last year. But things just didn't. And how many times can they not before we're like, there's a greater issue? I mean, it's something stinks. Something stinks. I don't know what it is. I can't put my finger on it, but it's just... It, it it's a recurring dream. I, I wake up, I watch Mets baseball. They're disappointing. And it shouldn't be with the roster, the caliber of players that we have on this team. And again, there were some positive things to take out of these games. Like, Star Marte doesn't look dead. Brett Beatty hit a left-handed lefty-lefty home run. Like, that was a huge home run. That was awesome. I thought that was another thing that was going to give this team a little bit of spark. It did a little bit with Pete then hitting the home run in the ninth. Like, I was like, okay, here we go. A little bit of life. That was exciting. But they played what, like, Four, four innings maybe of passionate, fun, exciting, like hard-nosed baseball. And then for the other, what, 23 this weekend, it was just like, when is this game going to end? What time do we go home? When's, when's my meal? When do I get to go see my wife? Like, I don't know. It's something is not right. Something stinks. Reese Hoskins is a fucking rat. I thought that was really going to wake him up. It did not. It did not at all, especially because he then completely just, pulled our pants down and was like, you have a small penis. I'm your daddy. Like I own you guys. Reese Hoskins Jeez. owns the Mets. There's no, there's no if, ands or buts around this fucking owns this organization right now, especially with the way that they handled going about hitting him, which was such a fucking mess. I mean, it's, it's frustrating because I, I re, I'm really, I'm really trying to not go crazy three games into the season but they have not given me anything to make me think that it's not going to be a repeat of last year. And I, I can't, I can't go through another season where it's over in fucking May. I can't do that right now. I, it's no fun. I love baseball. I was so excited. It was back. I've had way more fun watching every other team in baseball than literally being in person at a Mets game. My highlight so was the fact that fun. I got to go to the game with my dad on Saturday. Like that was awesome. We got to watch baseball with my dad, spend time with him. I didn't give a shit about what was actually going on on the field because it was so fucking terrible. Miserably, just miserably bad. And there were there was a weird feeling in the stadium from the beginning of opening day. Like there was a joy of being at opening day, but it just stadium wasn't even full until like the second or third inning. And there was no juice, no vibe, no energy the whole time. It was just, it felt awkward. It felt strange. And then you talk about the like Bailey Alvarez stuff, like positive from the weekend. Great things from the weekend. Both those guys hit their big home run Saturday. I think Alvarez got on base six out of 10 plate appearances this weekend. They both showed plenty of emotion. When Beatty hit that home run, he just slapped the hand of um, third base coaches. I don't remember who the third base coaches, which is bad doing a podcast, but it's not Anton Richardson, it's the other guy. The situation, uh, third base though, is Sarball. Yeah, Mike Sarball, correct. There it is. But even the situation around Brett Beatty playing this game on Saturday was fucking bizarre and showed things that 
we weren't concerned about anymore about process that we were concerned about a lot last year, where it was like, I couldn't comprehend the process behind that Brett Bailey home run in the eighth inning of Saturday's game off of lefty Hobie Milner, where Brett Bailey is not in the lineup to start Saturday's game because the Mets are facing a lefty, D.L. Hall. D.L. Hall is a lefty who has decent stuff and has good pedigree, but he has, is not someone I think is like reaching an echelon yet of a lefty where I want to sit players against him. But I also understand the thing with Bailey where it's like, okay, like we want to put him in, we want to keep the confidence up, put him in as many situations right now as possible to succeed. Okay, I get that. Brett Bailey, whatever. The old Bill Walsh talked about all the time. Put young players in situations to succeed where they can excel, and then when they do that, then you start giving them more, whatever. But if you're in a situation where you weren't going to play Bailey against lefties anyway for the first week of the season, it probably still made more sense to put Zach, uh, Mark Vientos on this roster over Zach Short. We've said a lot of things about Vientos in the show that we don't think he's exactly the highest caliber major league player that some people in the world do, but also that he just gives you more of an offensive ceiling than Zach Short. We know that Short's a good story, and Short was on the team for his defense. So that didn't happen. So I thought that was a weird process first. And then it compounded when Zach Short lets the ball clank off his glove. That wound up being a, a three-run error, but didn't get called an error. Sev, several runs first innings and met. Okay, this is bad too, but you know things happen. Things clank off gloves. And then Zach Short comes up in a few innings uh, with two men on and a righty on the mound. And you're like, hmm, okay. Now I was the righties on the mound. Zach Short grounds out. All right. I, I, I don't think you pinch hit for a guy in whatever it was, the fourth or the fifth inning. I think it was Elvis Peguero, who's just a, another member of this Brewers bullpen brigade that wouldn't stop this weekend, even without Devin Williams. Just throwing incredible stuff. But okay, whatever. You're not pinch hitting that early in the game. And then Zach Short comes up again against a righty in the sixth inning. I think it was two out, nobody on, but he was still not pinch hit for for Brett Beatty. So I was like, well, okay, I guess Zach, this is just Zach Short's day. Zach Short's getting the game now, whatever. Then Zach Short's spot comes up again in the eighth inning with a lefty on the mound. And now suddenly Brett Beatty comes out of the dugout, saunters out, and hits a huge home run, crushes the ball, shows tons of emotion, low and inside pitch, yanked it over the fence. Exactly everything we want to see from Beatty, lifting the ball, pulling the ball, staying in there against lefty. And you see how confident he is. You see how much the team is buzzing when he does that. You're like, hmm. Why did it take Brett Beatty the fourth play appearance of the game from that spot in the order against a left-handed pitcher to finally come in and get this pinch hit appearance? So then it's just you, you, you get weird that now the process is something that also was, is being hurt, and that was something that I was very confident would not be this year. And seeing that, I was like, this is a strange feeling again. Now things feel a little, now things feel a little fucked up. I honestly, I'll be, I'll say the truth. I really wasn't even focused on what managerial decisions were necessarily being made here and there because I was just so unimpressed with the actual play that was going on with the, on the field that like those little bits and pieces didn't bother me as much right now. Now you explaining them, I can totally see, you know, the fault and not making these moves here and there, like totally have a point, but it was just like, man, like on the field. So, so bad. I don't, Nobody seemed to no, they care. They care. I'm not gonna say nobody seemed to care. I'm not gonna go there. I'm not I'm not Frank the Tank. But like in the in the same regard, it's just it's hard to focus on the managerial decisions when the players really just didn't give you much either in terms of the actual play on the field. Like, yeah, I agree Brett Beatty probably should have been earlier in that game, but also at the same time, he had a pretty awful opening day. And I'm sure that again, like you mentioned, was to try and keep him in this in the uh situations to succeed the most but at the same time ah, it, it, this again this is just such a weird feel because i have never been three games into a season and for lack of a better term lost hope a little bit here um or been as frustrated as i have been three games into a season but the marlins or the marlins geez the brewers are a team that you mentioned earlier like if you want to be a playoff team you you're going to have to be able to beat them and they just simply outclassed us. And they didn't even really play that well, I feel like, at the end of the day. Like, they got hits here and there. But, like, a lot of them were, like, doinky little hits. Reese Hoskins, again, owned us. Like, fuck that guy, dirty slide. I I'm sure you guys might want to hear more about Reese Hoskins. But we got our asses handed to us, and he destroyed us. So there's no real conversation to have here that won't make us look like assholes. And I've been looking like an asshole all weekend with my Reese Hoskins comments. So I'm going to kind of just lay off of that for a little bit. But, like... I don't know, man. It was a, it's a bad vibe. It's a bad vibe. And even though those managerial decisions were questionable, I, I think it almost doesn't matter right now because he can make all the right decisions and they still play like this and they're not beating anybody. Sure. But again, then we also talked about the fact that all these games still wound up being close. And again, well, I don't think Carl's like, well, I'm not going to like sh shit on Carl's Mendoza for the first, his first two games of big league manager. It's just seeing these little things that I thought would be handled. I thought would be just more cohesive after all this time. I was just like, damn, like, even the things I really counted on here still didn't happen. And then 
Another thing I'll just talk about like quickly is like Luis Severino having his very bad start. I don't think it was as bad as as like it seemed statistically. The fact gave like twelve hits and six runs, that like well. that it sucks and looking. But I think out. also it was just like like you said, it was dinks and doings. There were a couple of really hard hit balls, but it seemed like the whole team was so preoccupied with the handling of Reese Hoskins that there wasn't even again like cohesive game plan for the rest of the Brewers. And I understand the fact that talked about before that they didn't hit Reese Hoskins the first inning. They're men on base. But then you saw when they threw at him in the seventh inning that Johan Ramirez was immediately ejected from the game, which is bullshit because there were no warnings administered to, e- administered to either side before that. So just from throwing at the guy, I don't, I don't see any reason why someone should be ejected immediately. You it also wasn't it. at his fucking head. He, like everybody was talking about, like he, he threw bent. it at his head. He but it was at his numbers on his back very clearly. I want to make that note. It wasn't near his head. He also ducked down, which made it closer. No, no fault to Reese Hoskins there. He's allowed to be upset about like, oh, that's close. Fine, totally. He just got 94 whizzed by him. But all the fans were like, he's throwing at his head. Fuck off. You don't know. You, you're blind. You did not see. And Johan Ramirez did not charge to go fight Reese Hoskins. If you watch the replay and if you were at the game, the ball hit the backstop, went all the way up in the air. He was going to catch it. He went off to the left originally, and then he went towards Reese Hoskins because they started jawing at each other. I want that to be known for Johan Ramirez. Okay, back to you, James. I had White Sox and Angels fans when I mentioned too, because they were like, honestly, like we don't even know if he was throwing at them. Like if you haven't watched any Johan Ramirez innings, like the ball could literally go anywhere. I think in this case it was pretty clear that he did throw at them because it was the first time the game was seemingly out of reach and Reese Hoskins needed one a little bit thrown at him. But again, it just seemed like the team was preoccupied with it. And it seemed like it was like a cloud over the whole game. And then the second he started getting hits off Luis Severino, it just seemed like everything started to snowball. And then again, like the Severino line was was poor. It wasn't good, but also like it was just it was it was a lot of hits. He had no command of a slider. He had zero slider whiffs. I don't know if they'll have a start the rest of the year with no slider whiffs because the pitch was still moving fine. All his velocity was still good. That slider was up to the mid mid high eighties. The fastball got up to ninety eight miles an hour. It was just it was a cold day, windy day, similar to Friday. And it's just like he didn't have a feel. He was hitting edges, but it was still in the middle of the zone. And just like all most of the pitches he get hit for Kiki up were against righties. And it was a righty heavy Brewers lineup. It was just a lack of being able to put guys away. Even the Reese Hoskins home run, the third or third inning, whenever it happened. He had him 0-2, and he was throwing some sliders, but he couldn't get the exact right spot on it, and then finally he threw one too many, and he just hung it over the middle of the plate, and then Reese Hoskins baptized us. Happy Easter, everybody. But it was just like, there's some, there was just something a little off about it. And I, I don't, it, wasn't, it wasn't the kind of outing that I would say is like super doomy and gloomy, but it was definitely one where it's just like, just get, get to another game. Like, he peppered the zone, 65% zone raised, less than 50% for his career, and they just kept making contact and kept finding the hole. Kept making contact, kept finding the hole. And then, he had that stupid balk where, again, like you talk about them wanting it more. Like Reese Hoskins hits a bloop single, one that you're just like, come fucking on. Like every single thing is going to go right for these guys that can go right for them. And just he winds up coming on a balk that was, seemed moderately questionable. That he, Severino was even even shocked about. And then also just like as he was losing his slider, he started throwing more changeups, right-handed hitters. And we've talked about this a little in the show that that's a pitch that it's, it's it's another thing as a weird process because it's a pitch that like probably appears to be pretty good on a spreadsheet or when you're doing pitch by pitch projections because changeups just usually have low batted ball quality and Severino's changeup moves so much against righties that it almost becomes weirdly sliderish and I think maybe that's why but also maybe because the slider just wasn't working so he's like I need another tool against righties I need another tool against righties I need another tool against righties but then he was also throwing high sinkers which we don't like. He was also throwing, Drew Smith, I think, on Sunday, was also throwing front door sweepers, which is also a weird thing. Like, if that thing doesn't really snap, if you miss a little bit with it, which is the same as the high sinker and the same as the righty righty changeup. If you miss a tiny bit, that pitch is suddenly so easy to hit. If a guy stands in against that front door sweeper, the ball is going into the upper deck. So just a more weird process things that maybe it was game planning, but maybe it's also just like their Mets are overmathing a little bit. And you don't want to, you want to overmath, you want to math exactly right. Once you start overmathing, you get into trouble, but Again, the dark cloud over the whole Severino start felt like it was the Hoskins thing. And a lot of people pointed out online, I think it is true because of how the Johan Ramirez situation winds up, that if you throw at him, you probably are ejected immediately. And you don't really want your starter ejected in the first inning of a game. You don't want your starter making his team debut ejected in his first inning with the team. And you also don't want to lose a starter when you have 19 games in 20 days. But then I throw this back at you. If you didn't do it because you knew that was going to happen, why not just prepare for it? I don't understand these guys have processes and these guys, like, they warm up, but, like, why not use an opener? Why don't just go 100 mirrors on the mound to open the game? Why not if you think that Luis Severino is going to get ejected after 10 pitches? Why don't you have him prepare to start again on Tuesday? Like, I understand this process, and these guys have very strict regiments, and we talk about this stuff all the time. You don't want to disrupt guys' ways that they're training, but it's also like, 
if you didn't do something, and again, this is all presumed, no one in the Mets organization has said this, but it seemed like this was the case, where you didn't throw with this guy early because you didn't want your player to get ejected, why not prepare for it? If you had this much knowledge of it, you were this aware this was probably going to happen, then just make a different move. Like, play it like chess. Like, do something that they're not expecting because you think something is going to happen. Like, just, it, it's a situation where there's, they're thinking and they're, over, they're, like, just focused on the wrong things where it's not, like, it's not sports anymore. It's not reacting. It's not baseball. They're just waiting for something to happen where it's, like, you have to go make something fucking happen. And the whole fucking vibe just pissed me off. It was the first time I've ever been, like, rationally mad at this team. Like, it was the end of Sunday's game where I shouldn't have been mad about this. It was, like, a 3-4 run game, whatever it was. And they panned to Lindor, who I'll never say anything bad about towards late in the game. And there was like a man on second, and like there was a foul ball just hit. I just see him like looking at his nails. I'm just like, fuck, <laughs> like, what the fuck? Like, talk, scream, yell, like, not, not scream or yell, but just like, I don't know. Like, it was, it just felt like a lack of engagement in the game that was happening. And it's just, and again, I think, I think everybody in the team was at fault for this this weekend. Whereas Jeff McNeil is standing over a guy that almost everyone in the roster has had a run in with. And it's just like, where the hell are we? Like, let's do something about it right now. Like, you, you don't have to throw it, Reese Hoskins. You hit him in the face on the spot. And maybe you get suspended, Jeff McNeil, for a few games. But you know what? Like, you get suspended for a few games. Like, everybody else will pick you up, and this team will get some life out of it. It's just, it just, it was lackluster. It was lifeless. It was painful. No, the, I think you actually said it best. The, I couldn't have said it any better. You said this team is waiting for something to happen rather than making something happen. And that is exactly how it has felt. For the last year and a half, two years, they are waiting for things to happen. They are not going out and getting it. They're not making plays. They're hoping the plays happen, and it's the same feeling we felt this weekend. That's truthfully that is the that is the exact feel I want to get out with this episode. Is that this team is waiting for things to happen rather than making them happen, and that's not a good sign. That's not a good sign for a good baseball team. That's not a good sign for a great baseball team, and for the Mets, a team that's on the borderline of maybe making the playoffs. They cannot afford for things to wait for them to happen. They need to make things happen. That's what the Dimebacks did. Like that Dimebacks team on paper last year wasn't particularly great, but they made shit happen. You look at the Rangers. That team was horrible years ago. They made shit happen. They got pitchers. They went and pitched and they shoved and they hit and they had rookies come up and the rookies came up and played well. They were making things happen. And right now the Mets are in a world where they're like, well, and this is, you know what? A little bit of our fault maybe too here. We're like, Lindor is going to be fine. He's going to be great. He's good. He's a good ball player. Pete's going to be great. We know he's going to be all right. Nimmo, like all these things. But like, fucking do it. Fucking show it. Like, I know it's three games into the season. Who cares what Francisco Lindor's batting average is? Why can't it be like Christian Yelich's though? Christian Yelich got, what, like six hits this weekend? Like, why Why Sweet do I hits. feel like we're always making excuses for our players for not showing up when other teams' players show up and they fucking play? And I feel like sometimes we just don't get that. Even guy like Bryce Terang, his jersey was dirty every single time he was on the field. Fucking he, Bryce Terang. Even Jackson Churio's first ever major league major league plate appearances. The guy's running hard. He's sliding. He's making plays on defense. He's beating out infield singles. It's just like what the fuck? Like why aren't we doing these same things? And just the Mets' lack of athleticism is so apparent when you take, play a team like the Brewers that is still so athletic. I know the Mets are doing more to be athletic, but it's just like it's not there yet. It's just this roster. You're probably another year away from like having true athleticism because even our young guys don't really run particularly well we don't have a lightning player like jackson churio or like first round picks who are sneaking into the lineup again who are really really fast and athletic like sal free like and bryce terang where it's just like i like seeing guys run fast and then we even talk about like making things happen doing things and there's been like a very much an oscillation between like a show that we're concerned with numbers and concerned projections a show that's concerned with you know grit and baseball and determination even the numbers the mess playoff odds on fan grass from just this weekend dropped from 33 percent to 23 percent a 10 percentage point drop in playoff odds in one weekend that is a disaster that is so bad you just went you went from one in three chance to make the playoffs to less than a one in four chance to make the playoffs and it felt worse than that and also i just don't i don't know how this ends because this is a situation where this team is playing like shit and we know the starting rotations patchwork like this is when you really want a guy you can bank on the rotation and the skid like this who's ending this skid adrian hauser's not ending this skid Jose Quintana is not ending the skid like that's not how this rotation is built you just kind of need to be the team one day. You need to play not good innings to win. And it's just, God, you see teams like the Pirates have fun weekends. You see teams like the Diamondbacks have fun weekends. Even a team like the Cardinals beat the Dodgers, and you couldn't beat the Brewers? Like, what the hell are we doing here? The Rockies won a game. We didn't win a game. I guess the Astros also didn't win a game, but I, the Astros don't care about baseball until July 15th. Like, they, they, don't even, they don't even register the season begins until, like, the ALDS. It's painful to watch this shit. The Red Sox won two games. The Red Sox were pitching were awesome. And the Mets are over here just, like, 
smacked themselves in the face. Like, what are we doing? Yeah, I don't know. It's just it's it was bad. I really would love to put this weekend behind us. I hope this is the most negative we ever are on an episode this year because I I really I hate this. This is so not fun to talk like this. Like, yeah, we were shills before and we were Mr. Positivity like to a fault and it was awful. It was terrible. This is a this is almost as bad of a feeling as when we had to like lie about how good this team was because it's it's no fun to come on here and be negative. If you want to hear negativity, there are so many people out there that you can listen to. We don't want to be those guys. But at the same time, now that we can be, now that we can be realistic, now that we can tell you the truth, it fucking we, stinks. it's kind of our obligation to since we've been holding out for about a year and a half about this stuff because boy, oh boy, this is this is eerily similar to what we've been seeing and I, I cannot stand it. I can't. This is not a three-game issue to start the season. This is an issue that's been happening for a long time. And I hope they fucking wake up. Wait, I can't believe I'm saying on April 1st, the Mets need to wake up, but they do need to wake up right now because the Tigers are coming into town who are playing some good baseball. They got to beat up the White Sox. They'll kick the shit out of us. And I put out a tweet talking about how if the Mets get swept by the Tigers, I'm going to do the hot dog straw with the beer. In case you guys haven't seen it, there was a psychopath at a Yankee game a few years ago who took a straw, poked a hole through a hot dog. So we had a straw, decided not going to use it, poke a hole through the hot dog, uh, like a, like a cylinder, hollowed it out, use the hot dog as a straw in his beer. I will do that at the next Mets game I go to if they get swept by the Tigers. And let me tell you, I don't want to do that. It seems fucking disgusting. So please, for the love of God, play good baseball, beat this team. Because if you don't, we're looking at an 0-6 start and I'm going to be depressed. I'm going to be I'm gonna be intolerable. I mean, if you're so willing to have a hot dog and a beer within four seconds of each other, a sip and a bite, like why, why not just put them together? It doesn't seem that bad. You get the salt with the brine and the hops or whatever. It's just not that Sip's bad. Wrong. But the sip is like, even, even just, even just before we move on a little bit, like, again, we have to like talk about the brief positives. Like Alvarez is awesome. Bailey hitting the lefty lefty yes. home run, but also having some weird at bats. Like we'll take the positives. He also, Bailey looked good in the field. This is the most confident Brett Bay's ever looked in the field. And it seemed like the only play he did make that was poor. I don't remember if it was Saturday or Sunday early in the game, but it was like a Bryce Tarang swing bunt. Where again, he just got caught in no man's land. A ball cl- clanked off like a low line drive, clanked off his bare hand. But he was back, or he, he was either back way back on the grass, or he was way up on the dirt. And it just seemed like there was like a lot of cohesiveness in his position. It was really nice to see. It felt like he took that confidence with him into the dish, which is the opposite how it felt last year. And also briefly, the bullpen actually did look good. I think most of the guys came out of the bullpen. Drew Smith, a few good innings. Adovino and Jorge Lopez did not, but I, I don't think it was ways that should be disastrous. Edwin Diaz being back in the mound is a great feeling. Um, I mentioned Deekman having a good inning. Johan Ramirez, fucking shout out Johan Ramirez, knowing he was going to the guillotine, getting suspended for three games, and giving, what, 45 pitches on Sunday in a, when a, team, in a game the team was down by multiple runs. Michael Tonkin gave a few innings in a game the team was down by multiple runs. All that stuff, nice stuff. Maybe if you're ever winning a game, it could all come back and use. Brooks Ray looked disgusting for his one inning. And then just briefly talk about Tyler McGill, because he had such a Tyler McGill start, and I felt like such a loser for buying in for like some February Tyler McGill starts and seeing the exact same guy onto the mound where the painful. slider still looked fine. The fastball like looked better than I think it did last year. The splitter when he had it was good, but also it was very inconsistent. And then like the quintessential Tyler McGill experience just completely vacuum sealed into a three hour time span after the game to getting a shoulder MRI, which was like perfect. That was, this year, you know, if we can just, if we can just speed, speed run the whole Tyler McGill thing, it would be probably better for everyone's sanity, better for mess Twitter in general, but we likely now see Jose Budo and Joey Lucchese over the next few weeks because this is not getting easier for the Mets. One of the Tigers coming to town are a good team. It's also so perfectly painful that these two teams murdered the Mets beginning of last year, last April, where we were all like, oh my God, the Brewers killed us. Oh my God, the Tigers killed us. Oh my God, this baseball team sucks. And now it's happening again, but right in front of our faces begin the year. But we're going to have 19, 16 games in the next 17 days against and part of that's going to be the Braves. It's like, fuck, I don't want to do this shit. But We'll talk about the Tigers now for a few minutes because Tigers are a team that are probably one of the most exciting in baseball this year. One of those teams, I like, like the Pirates, like the Brewers, that are like, they're about, they, I think they could really exceed expectations and they're looking really good right now. Like everything's working differently from the Mets where nothing is working. And a lot of exciting players in this team that might not have made their way into like the national media space yet. With the Tigers, you're looking at, let's just go over the big names for you real quick. Javier Baez has looked as bad as you possibly can. You know, he's going to come in and hit a home run this weekend. Did you start or this week? Guaranteed. Colt Keith, uh, rookie second baseman hasn't looked great, but he's a good ball player. Spencer Torkelson, good ball player, not swinging the bat. Well, but then like Mark Canna's a part of this team. Mark Canna's had a great, had a great weekend. Riley Green's a really good ball player. Parker Meadows, Kerry Carpenter. They've gotten big performances out of guys like Andy Abanez, who's hitting the ball really well. Carson Kelly hit a big home run for them and they're pitching. 
is very good. Their bullpen is maybe one of the most underrated in all of baseball. Like this is not the Tigers team that it was last year, even though again, they beat the pants off of us, which was so, so fucking embarrassing. And we should have known that the season was dead then, but they're much better this year and they're coming in hot. This is a team that wants to make the playoffs. Like you said, that could surprise a lot of people. This is not an easy series by any means, especially seeing how the Mets just played baseball the last 72 hours, essentially. And the fact that, again, every team comes to City Field wanting to murder the Mets. Like, we have a target on our backs, but we don't act like it anymore. Like, we have to, we have to be bad guys. We have to. And I don't want to pull up tabs to do the pitching matchups. So can you pull up the tabs to the pitching matchups? My engine connection is so bad. But I know we have Tarek Skubal coming into town this week, and he is – the best pitcher in baseball no one's talking about. I think, like, again, like, we, we're psychopaths and we play a lot of fancy baseball. So, like, we talk about him, we've been knowing about him, but it's just like, you can see Tarek Skubal, Tarek, Tarek Skubal throw a fastball and you're gonna be like, oh my God. And then you're going to watch their bolt, the Tigers' bowl book, and then you're going to remember Shelby Miller, a player that was once upon a time traded for Dansby Swanson and Darren Arte. I've got the pitching matchups for you. I'll interject here before you get to wax poetic about the pitchers here. So, on Monday night, got a, we've got a couple ace offs in this series. Let me tell you about it. We've got Sean and I going up against Reese Olsen. Tuesday night, Adrian Hauser versus Casey Mize. And then Wednesday night, this is the big one. You mentioned Tariq Skubal, or sorry, it's technically Tarek Skubal. Tarek Skubal. I always pronounce him wrong. Tariq Skubal. No, Tarek Skubal. Uh, going up against Mets opening day starter and ace, Jose Quintana. So, yeah, tickets as low as $5. And I got a feeling they might go even lower. Oh, my God. They should be paying us $5 to go into these games at this point. And also, like, $40 parking. Could that suck so bad? $40 parking is insane. Criminal. And the Mets, well, they're like, Criminal. they're high price, they're high price luxury and food items. Like, wow. Now, now, <laughs> now lobster roll on a burger seems a little fucked up for $40. But this Tigers team, like, listening to that pitching, where Casey Mize, a former number one overall pick, he kind of <laughs> went all the way down to the depth, all the way down to the depths of hell. But now he's come back. He's got more ride in his fastball. He ditched his sinker. And the splitter's still good. And breaking balls are still good. Scoobal, again, the fastball's amazing. The slider's amazing. And then Reese Olsen is such a fun pitcher, a pitcher I'd love to have on the Mets, a pitcher I could kind of see as like my mold for what I hope Mike Vassell becomes, where he has a slider, where Vassell, I think it'd probably be the curveball. Maybe it's a sweeper, depending how it's developed. Reese Olsen's slider is so awesome. And the rest of that, he's just such a ball. He's just a kitchen sink guy. He just goes out there and pitches. He'll hit a spot. He'll surprise you because he has four different offerings. He's a very fun pitcher to watch. And then when you get into this Tigers bullpen, I mentioned before, Shelby Miller has been remade in the image of God here, where he's throwing big-time fastballs with high ride and a big slider. Jason Foley, if you guys haven't heard the name Jason Foley, get ready to hear the name this week because I'm sure he's going to have save opportunities against the Mets. Jason Foley throws 102-mile-an-hour demon sinkers that will start on the left-hander's hip and end up right middle in. They'll, they will, they'll be baffled by it with sliders drop, gyro sliders dropping off it. Alex Lang, the pitcher who's been demoted because every other Tigers pitcher got so good, still has an amazing curveball sinker combination. He doesn't really know where the ball's going half the time. Bo Brisky, yes, Bo Brisky. The Tigers have made Bo Brisky into a high leverage late inning reliever. Got through his BBs. It's just they're a team that they changed manage, upper management early last season. And since it happened on a dime, everything with this team has gotten better. And I think we're looking at Riley Green as someone who's going to be potentially an American League All Star this year as an engine towards the middle top of that lineup. And it's just they're a team ascending right now. And if the Mets wind up 0-6, the season will, for lack of a better term, be almost seemingly over with the, for a team with no starting pitching and no edge. So I don't want to be at that place. And again, I hate giving you guys podcasts like this because it shouldn't be this way, but maybe it's just a part of an exorcism for me and Mark where we weren't allowed to be negative for a year and a half. And now this was a lot of negative shit that happened at once and it feels awful, but that's the game and it sucks. But that was what we all just watched this weekend. It's terrible. Hopefully they play better. I'm uh, maybe it's because three o'clock in the morning and I'm tired and I just, I don't even care anymore. I don't know. I'm, I'm so over this past opening day weekend series. I hope we never have to talk about this again. I hope we can be positive on the next episode. This is not fun for us to do over here. Uh, we are going to bring in a new segment that we, I mean, it would have been nice if the Mets were winning. We probably had some more funny ones, but since the Mets played like shit, I'll be the first one on this new segment. Uh, I don't know. We're going to call it idiot of the week, bad take of the week, whatever it was. Uh, your boy was just missing left and right in terms of Mets takes this weekend. I quote tweeted the Brewers because uh, they were like ready for opening day. I said Mets are going to win 6 nothing. Clearly that, that was not the case. Uh, I tweeted out, beat, let's go Mets. Fuck Reese Hoskins, beat the Brewers. The Mets did not, and Reese Hoskins had the game of his fucking life against the Mets. And then game three, I'm like, I'm I'm gonna fucking drink a lot at Easter because I can't I can't stand this team. They're just they're driving me crazy. And they're like, oh man, three games into the season, like you're already getting baseball uh, unpre- un- pre- unfortunate events preceded whatever that fucking Twitter account is, where they're like, oops, you tweeted this out, and then what happened? Uh, 
my gambling has been great. I've been money with that, but I cannot do anything right when it comes to the Mets. So idiot take of the week. First one for me. Uh, it, it's going to be all about me. And you know what? I'll do better. I'll do better Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday. We'll have better tweets in terms of the Mets stuff. Hopefully not negative. Yeah, being this dejected and the team hasn't played a single game yet in April is a shit place to be and one I, I do not envy. First time the Mets have been 0-3 in 10, uh, in 10 years, 2014. I think the last time it happened before 2014 was 2005, which is just like, geez. Oh, something literally year. happened. The fact that those are, those are some of the worst years we remember in Mets history, not, like not really Mets history, but some of the worst years we can remember in our lifetimes, but also the fact that it's just this something happens once every decade. Now it's happening again. It's like, God damn, I want this to happen. And then my yearly opening week schedule tirade, Mets play the Brewers in this series. And next time Mets play the Brewers is the last series of the year. So this Mets entire season is one Brewers sandwich. It's one big Brewers Oreo, which is so fucking stupid. And we don't even have a divisional game for another week and a half. It's so dumb. This whole schedule is so dumb. I hate the Major League Baseball schedule so much. But that was my quick tirade. That's fair. That's fair. I mean, we're, we're due to be curmudgeon like you said, maybe because... We weren't allowed to talk like this last year, and it was a season that me and you off camera had a lot of things to say uh, in terms of the play on and off the field was just was just so bad. Maybe we need this exorcism. Maybe we had to get the evil out of us because we have not been able to do so yet. So that's going to be my spin. That's going to be a positive spin for the end of this episode. We had to expel these horrible, awful feelings, get them out. The Mets are 0-3 since they got rid of us as the official podcast, which coincidence, coincidence? Mets stuff's not the official podcast of the team, and they're 0-3 to start the year. Haven't won a game yet since that's happened. So I'm not saying to blame blame whoever made those decisions, but hey, just just letting you know that the Mets were not 0-3 last year to start the season and we were there. But uh, yeah, I got nothing else, James. You got anything else while we're in Italy? Uh, apologies to those of you out there if you're listening to this and it sounds a little bit different. The connection's rough right now. We're, we're working through it. We still wanted to get you this episode out, of course, because it's a big one for us. Uh, and I'm I'm sure stuff will improve as we get going on throughout the season. But last final thoughts and regards here. Absolutely nothing. Fuck this weekend. Yeah, fuck this weekend. Uh, let's go Mets play better. Guys, thank you so much for listening and watching. You know what to do. Make sure you follow us on all our social media at MetsUp on Twitter, Instagram, and TikTok. Subscribe to the New York or nope, 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 nope. No, don't do don't that. Subscribe to their channel. Subscribe do to that. the Mets Up podcast channel if you want to see the video version of this. Uh, if you're listening to us, Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Google, whatever it is. Drop us a rating, drop us a review, download, and subscribe. I'm going to say it. Follow James on Twitter at James underscore Shiano. It's so hard for us to interact in good time right now, so I'm just going to take that from him. You can follow me at DraftNickMark with a C. Thank you guys for listening. Thank you for watching, and we will catch you after the Tiger series for the love of God win a fucking baseball game. Peace out. Peace out. See you guys next time.